chat before we started that um, she couldn't be here and she would like somebody to start the recording. Does anyone have anything to declare before we um, we begin tonight? I'm going to just drop our, our page link for the um, Herrig pages into the chat. And uh, we're looking at that now. <clears throat> if I click on the Herrig link, just like usual, I uh, have added the link for last week to the YouTube recording um, of the whole session, and I'll do the same tonight as usual. And tonight's topic is uh, linear regression. It's simple linear regression. I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I've, I've t tittled around with different formats for this, but I think what I'm going to do tonight is uh, just go ahead and go through the lecture briskly and uh, then do some live coding. I, I think if there are a lot of us, I might do breakout rooms, but um, <clears throat> if they're not, I think I'll just uh, lead some live coding and take questions if people have already attempted some of the exercises or maybe do as many exercises as we can get through. So I'm just going to, uh, if you'd like to follow along with the slides, I'll just copy the link address and drop it into the chat before I launch it here. Now I'm going to launch it. OK, I see the title of my slide is um, <clears throat> 2.3, but it, it should read 2.4. So uh, today is 2.4, and we still have 2.5. And 2.6. So we'll finish the boot camp in two weeks on the stats topics. Now, um, the inventor of the term regression, I believe just the, uh, the use of regression in the statistical sense, is, is attributed to the person who also invented it. I may have mentioned this individual before in here, Francis Galton. It's a relative of Charles Darwin two generations or so um, junior to uh, Charles Darwin. He's very famous as a scientist himself. Um, he did invent regression, regression and, and applied it to, um, he was interested in uh, heritable traits in, in humans and in, in other species. And he applied regression to predicting um, a continuous variable that, that you could measure which was um, which was the height of an individual, and he and he he predicted it based on the average height of the individual's parents, and he was interested in the heritability of traits like this, like height. And uh, his his observation that gave rise to the term regression was um, kind of famously this observation that unless you have a perfect relationship between the predictor variable and the thing you're trying to predict that the slope tends to tends to be um, lower uh, than uh, than um, one to one if it's on the same scale and he and Francis Galton termed that regression that's where the tool originated and that's where the, the term came from now <clears throat> If you were going to invest in uh, one tool that you really learned that was you could only pick one to uh, to turn data into information as a scientist, you would definitely pick regression. It's the basis of almost every other common statistical tool. I, I specified in the title of this page that we're we're going to talk about simple linear regression. And so, you know, simple linear regression is just a subset of all the, all the huge world of different kinds of linear models, some nonlinear models, some that have many predictors instead of just one, some that have um, um, residual error that is distributed in a different way to Gaussian. Okay, so there is a galaxy of tools. And if you could pick only one statistics tool to really dig into, I would definitely recommend regression. We use it to uh, quantify causation. So uh, unlike correlation that we talked about last week, 
when we talk about um, regression, we we are implicitly implying an, an effect of that y that y axis variable by the x variable, so that x um, causes some some uh, variation in y and can then be used to predict values of y. So that's the specific numerical predictive power of uh, regression. And and yeah, it's the foundation of other linear models. And what we mean by linear models are are ones that um, ones that are like analysis of variance, uh, multiple regression, principal component analysis, uh, and the generalized linear model is also a uh, linear model. <clears throat> now um, we'll go through these sections tonight as usual for uh, for the regression page. There's um, we, we want to start thinking now we've gotten through all the basic stuff and we're up to the most interesting last three pages here. Um, first thing I want to address is, you know, what is the specific statistical question we're asking with linear regression? There actually are several questions we can ask, but we usually are only interested in just one of them. So we'll talk about what they are and look at how to do that. We'll look at the data requirements for regression and the assumptions we make. We'll look at a typical way to graph regression. Um, we'll look at tests. I say tests and alternatives, but I, in the lecture, I'm not going over the um, alternative tests for regression. Um, and then the practice exercises, we'll see how much time that we have. <clears throat> now, what is the question? Well, um, there are different ways to formulate it, but one way of formulating it is, is, a, is to ask, does our X variable explain significant variation in Y? Does X explain variation in Y? This could be, you know, does your, your parents' average height explain significant variation in your height. It could be, you know, many formulations, and we'll look at um, at least one example in a second. But really, we boil it down to uh, a, a specific statistical question. And for regression, the main statistical question we boil it down to is um, whether the slope of the regression is different to zero. And if it is different to zero, we would say that X does explain significant variation in Y. And I'll, I'll show you when we calculate a regression that you can ask some other statistical questions about regression, but it is usually that slope question that we report. Now here I have, uh, for the data science guys that are in the um, chat, you'll look at this equation. This is an equation of a, of a line. Uh, we would read this y uh, equals alpha, the Greek letter alpha, plus beta times x plus the Greek letter epsilon. Y equals alpha plus beta times x plus epsilon. This is just a uh, theoretical way to summarize in mathematical notation the equation of a line and it's the equation for linear regression. The data science students will notice that I've put this in a slightly different format. Um, they would have seen beta zero and beta one, but this this equation means exactly the same thing as the other version of of the variables that I've shown you. The reason I've used this alpha and beta is because this is the traditional way to uh, to just show um, simple linear regression. And uh, in a nutshell, some details here. I don't want to spend all night on a stupid equation. because It's not really about that. But the equation is very useful to arrange the way we think about this. It's a capital Y. And, and capitals in this kind of notation um, our shorthand for matrices, and in, in this case, it's a matrix with just um, one column that are all the observations, or a vector is another way to call a matrix with one column. It's a vector of all the different measurements of different, say, individuals 
whose height you have measured. And the X is likewise a, um, a vector of all the <clears throat> average heights of parents of each of those individuals. The A and the B, the alpha and beta, are what we call regression coefficients, and they're quantities that we're going to estimate based on our sample from the whole population of human heights. Um, the alpha is the intercept. I'll explain what that means in a, in a second. And the beta is the slope. Uh, and it's this beta that we're interested in, uh, you know, using a statistical test to resolve whether or not there's evidence it's different to zero. The epsilon is a shorthand for error, E for error. <clears throat> Easy to remember. And uh, it's, um, if we have these two coefficients um, that can be used with some variable to explain variation and why, the epsilon represents the leftover um, error that isn't explained by the model. So it's, uh, we also call it sometimes the residual error. Okay, so this is just a way to symbolize linear regression. And um, we have some formal assumptions. I've, I've just put the formal assumptions. I've got a more um, human friendly way to call the assumptions that I'll show you on the next slide. But, but I think it's important to get used to. I mentioned last week, perhaps, that I've changed my thinking on on the use of these equations. And I, I, I have avoided them for a lot of my career when, when working with non-stats uh, non and math people. But um, I, I've changed my mind. I think actually it is important now because a lot of times in our literature, even in the crops literature, I see equations these days. And that's a relatively recent change. So I've, I've started showing them. All right, so um, here are the formal assumptions in equation form, and then I'll translate them to um, human versions. Not one for one human versions, but I will translate them into a form of uh, human language. This first representation is, um, notice that this is a little y, and it's got a subscript i. So that's that symbolizes those individual observations that were symbolized in matrix version in the previous equation, but this is the equation for the individual observations. So here we have a Y observation. This is a picture, so I can't highlight it. But this Y is a is a vector, and each I is one of the individual rows of observations. We've got our alpha and our beta. We've got XI, again, individual observations, and we've got an error that is also associated with each of those observations. We assume that the error is distributed Gaussian, so the normal bell curve distribution. Normal in air quotes, because you know I don't like to use the normal word because that implies typical. The so Gaussian is a specific um, assumption here uh, of, a, of a random error that's centered at zero uh, in that bell curve shape where most of the, um, most of the values of the error are near zero, and they become decreasingly common as they get farther away from zero, positive or negative. And we, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, as you know, the Gaussian curve, Gaussian distribution is um, summarized by a mean and a variance. So here, the mean we assume is that the error has a mean of zero and some uh, variance sigma squared that we'll estimate from our data. Um, now we we calculate that variance with the sum of squares of the residuals, SS subscript res. That just means sum of squares for the residuals. And it's the sum of the deviations of, uh, of each y observation as a function of um, the rest of the equation squared. So it's that that is what is used to calculate those those error terms. We can calculate this the, the uh, estimate of the slope. Notice the little hat that symbolizes an estimate that we're making based on our sample. Um, so we're estimating the one without the hat, the real population slope from our, our sample 
It's the slope estimate with a little hat. And I'm not going to go through these equations, but um, this is what's happening behind the scenes to estimate the slope. And I mean, the uh, <clears throat> intercept estimate rather is uh, once we estimate our slope, it's estimated as the difference between the mean y value and the estimate of the slope times the mean x value. So, uh, you know, if you wanted to, you could you could figure out these equations equations numerically, but but we can we can bypass that if you're not interested in it, and we can uh, evaluate some of the uh, informal assumptions that we have explicit responsibility to evaluate as data analysts, you know, as scientists. You know, one of them for regression is that the relationship's linear. Uh, we usually evaluate that informally uh, by by examining the data. Um, graphically, usually, uh, two that our our numbers, our data, are um, continuous numeric data. At least our y must be a continuous numeric um, variable. The x often is a continuous numeric variable, like the average height of the parents. But the uh, the x could also be an ordinal variable like um, the hours of an experiment or the order that someone comes in in a race. <clears throat> so it could be um, non-continuous for the uh, predictor variable. We assume the residuals are Gaussian. Now this is one that we usually test, um, often formally, but, um, but I'll, I'll show you informal methods as well. And one, once you get used to um, testing them formally, you often you often would uh, test them informally, and that's good enough. Homoscedasticity is something we've mentioned before with a funny name. Um, I think I linked to a paper on one of the pages about the pronunciation of it. All it means is that there's equal variance of the y variable across the whole length of the uh, the x variable, and we'll look look at that graphically. <clears throat> And then finally, we make an assumption that there is independence of observations. So um, often we might illustrate something like this assumption with an example of what's not independent. So something that would not be independent would be if you measured, uh, say, five individuals and you, you measured those five individuals three times each. Well, each of those three measures within an individual, let's say you're measuring blood pressure or hormone level, those would be non-independent because you measured them within the same individual. So you, when we're making uh, for simple linear regression, all of the observations must be independent. <clears throat> now, um, First example, the data example that we'll be working with here is um, from some public data. It's a Kaggle data set. Um, for those of you who haven't been on the Kaggle website, it's a it's a, a large, very popular website um, for people who are interested in skilling up um, numerate skills and some computer programming skills, and it runs the gamut between statistics to artificial intelligence and machine learning, and they also have data sets. And uh, this is um, a, a data set that contains fish market data. And uh, I, I, it's a very simple data set. It's kind of nice data set. It has um, a, a variable called species that just reads in as a character, and it's different species of fish. It's six or seven species of fish. We'll look at them in a second. Um, there is the weight, which is a numeric weight in grams. There are several measures of length. Well, length one is the vertical length in centimeters. Length two is something called the diagonal length in centimeters. Length three is the cross length um, in centimeters. There's a height of the fish, I presume, from the, um, from the uh, uh, lateral view of the fish, and the width of the fish is, I pres presume, from the top view, the dorsal view, 
the uh, the numeric width of the fish. All of those are in centimeters. So we have a bunch of uh, um, of continuous numerical variables. There's a link if you're interested in looking at the data set yourself. Now I, I've copied um, <clears throat> this data set and I've linked it on the top of the um, the web page for this boot camp page. And uh, I've I've converted it into a tidy data set with a data dictionary. So we may look at that in a second when we do some coding. OK, <clears throat> so. Um, so I've, I've just here used the library open XLSX. And I've just read in the Excel file with read.xlsx, the main um, the main uh, function to read in Excel files that I like to use. There are some others, though. If we are Radio 4, I would say there are, all our are alternative packages and functions. Um, and then I've used the head function here to display just the first six lines to give us a flavor for what the data looks like. The head functions just, just to give us a peek at what the data look like. <clears throat> And yeah, you can see the different numeric measures and you can see the character of the species. OK, so everything is as expected so far. Now on the page, I go through this um, um, in the early boot camps. We um, talked about ways to slice out bits of data and uh, occasionally now I was like this as a student myself. <clears throat> where I was like a, um, I, I would I would brutally interrogate a, an Excel spreadsheet to arrange the data in a way that I wanted to, and I, I was a heavy Excel user when I was a, a PhD student. <clears throat> and what what I would tend to do, um, and this was kind of before I I learned about how powerful uh, manipulating data purely with code could be is I would make different versions of my data set. And um, I still occasionally will will meet um, somebody who who approaches how extreme I was in it. And I've only met one person I think that is, is more extreme than I was. I might, I might have 20 versions of a data set and I would curate them all. I was, very, I was and still am a very organized person and I would, I would keep all these data sets, but that's re really bad practice. Um, we recall from the earlier boot camps that um, that curating your data into a master data file that's very clear and obvious to another person is one of the, well, it's considered best practice. There's a literature on it. It's one of the most important things for your data to remain valuable even to yourself in the future. And I did meet a person there. I just checked to see if they were in the chat. I'm definitely not going to name them, but um, <clears throat> they're the most, most extreme person. They sent me a data set that had about um, two or 300 observations in it and some number of columns, not a huge number, less than 10 variables, but they sent me 42 files for one single analysis <laughs> for this data set. But we can sidestep all of that programmatically in R so easily. So what what if I wanted to slice out, you know, so using that that programmatic R term about um, subsetting data? What if I wanted to slice out the rows that just contained perch? And uh, in one of those early data sets, without making a new spreadsheet or anything, I read in the one master data set, <clears throat> and I can exploit this Boolean phrase that goes into the species um, variable and asks uh, which species values are equivalent to the character string perch. What the output of this um, Boolean expression is, is a series of trues and falses for whether or not each value in each row of the dat dollar sign species um, object is equivalent to perch. So I get this vector of trues and falses. And we have done this. It's been a few weeks since we went over this. But the way that we use this is we exploit this phrase in the square brackets notation on the data object. So I've made the whole data object is a dat. 
and I've got the comma in the square bracket brackets with the row number and the columns um, on either side of the bracket. And here on the left side, I've inserted that um, vector of trues and falses. And where it's true, it will slice out the uh, the values. I've left the columns blank because I want all the columns. And so I'm making a new data object called Bert perch that just has the perch rows. And when I slice it out like that and we look at the head, um, I see that now this is the top six values of the perch data frame. It has the same data, except it's just picked the rows with perch. Let me show you a little thing that I've just noticed myself that I occasionally have to contend with. Notice that um, even though this is the first six rows of my new little data object called perch, Notice how the row index numbers start at 73. Well, if we go back to the previous slide, we can see an index um, here. So this is the 20 row 25. This is um, row 20, 37. And if we could see it goes off the page a little bit, we can see it wraps around and the trues start at row 73. So that I've sliced them out, but it's retained the row numbers. Sometimes that's very useful if you're subsetting your data. Sometimes it's annoying and you want to get rid of that. I'm just pointing it out as it's one of the features that we tend to use here. Well, um, <clears throat> oftentimes we want to graph a, a statistical test. We want to graph our data and try, try graphically. I, I do this as a rule. Um, if I'm going to do a simple linear regression or any other statistical test before I examine the, res the results of the actual statistical analysis, I will graph it in some form. I, I use this as a little tool and, uh, and also a little game that I find a little fun, but um, it's also a intellectually very, very powerful tool to use as a scientist, where uh, if we graph um, data that represents a statistical test, we can form a, a, uh, an expectation of what the results of the test will be. And then we can compare, in, and in just short order, we will do exactly that. We will compare our expectation with the numer numerical summary. So we're able to compare our expectation with the actual real world results. Now here I've made the typical graph that we make of a linear regression. I've got my two variables here. Um, the dependent variable by convention is always graphed on the y-axis. And here we're predicting variation in height as a function of width. Also by convention, with linear regression and only with linear regression, as opposed to correlation, we don't do the same thing with correlation. We'll draw the regression line on. <clears throat> So the very least you can do is to use the uh, plot function, just the plain old plot function, set your y-axis to the y argument, set your x-axis variable to the x argument. Um, and to draw the, what that will do, if we just execute this first line, the plot, it would just make a scatter plot without the line. To make the line, we have to actually calculate the regression. Um, so what I've done in this line is uh, using the LM function, stands for linear model. Now that's the standard workhorse for simple linear regression in R. And uh, here I've, I, I've implied the function argument, uh, the um, formula argument, <clears throat> but I've, I've supplied the value of height as a function of width, the little tilde you may recall we, we read it as a function of in human language. So this is height as a function of width, and I've set the data argument to perch. And uh, I've put that in a data object called lm0 underscore perch, linear model zero for perch. And then we use the ab line function on that, that model object. Now the model object contains our estimates of that that uh, intercept, the alpha 
coefficient and the slope, the beta coefficient. And uh, the AB line reaches in that linear model object, that data object, plucks them out, and it graphs the line over there. Now, this is the least you can do. This is a pretty poor graph because um, I haven't, you know, bothered to make the um, the axis titles readable or anything else. It's not very aesthetically pleasing. So with just a little bit of addition. We uh, here, are, in addition to the X and the Y um, arguments, I've added an X label argument, height and centimeters. I mean, a Y label and an X label as well, width and centimeters. I don't, for my own graphs, it's my own personal style. I, I don't like to actually put titles on my graphs. And the only exception is if I'm, um, is if I'm, um, just in the easiest possible way, making some results to show someone else, like in a PowerPoint presentation, or, or maybe I'll have several graphs, and I, and I want a visual way to tell them apart. That that's when I tend to use it. So I'm really just doing this here for um, an example of how to do it. But the main argument within the plot function allows us to add a a title here, my perch regression plot. And then some aesthetic ones that are just trivial touches that it, um, I do find them aesthetically pleasing, but I also find them functional. Uh, I like to add a little bit of color. I, <clears throat> and I also like to change the, um, the um, symbol of the point. Now, um, I, I often use 16 or 20. 20 is a small dot that's solid, and 16 is a large dot that's solid. And I like that better than the the um, default, which is PCH of one, which is an open circle. I think these just are aesthetically better and easier for me to look at and wrap my head around, especially when it's complicated. Um, blue is also a high contrast color as opposed to black. And I like to be able to see the difference between different features. And here there's more than one feature. There's a regression line and dots. Um, so the color here is functional. It's not a it's not a um, a uh, just a superfluous thing that's being added to the graph. The CEX argument is one that sets uh, we've used it before in the boot camp before today. It's one that sets the relative size of the features of the graph. Here it sets the relative size of the dots of the symbols. Um, one is uh, purely proportional to the um, resolution of the graph. And as you go a little bit above one, like 1.2, 1.3, the dots get proportionally bigger. You can also go smaller, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. So if you have a lot of data, you would tend to go smaller. Uh, I, I rarely tend to go bigger than one or 1.2. So this is an aesthetic thing. And if you have lots of graphs, you want the aesthetics all to match. So it's just something you can have complete control over. <clears throat> now, I mentioned the residuals. We make the Gaussian assumption with residuals. And the way that we look at these first, if, um, if I have analyzed data with any of you, I'm casting my eyes across there, and I have analyzed data with a number of you in here, you will have seen me make a plot like this probably if we've done any kind of linear model where I've, I've calculated a linear model, I wrap it in the residuals function to pull out the calculation of each individual residual from that linear model. And then I wrap that in the histogram function just to show us the density of residuals for each value. And what we expect is a nice, smooth, Gaussian bell-shaped curve. But instead, we get this. It doesn't look nice in Gaussian, does it? As a matter of fact, if we just go back to the data for a second. Um, when I look at the distance from each of these from the line, just in my mind, you get practiced at, at doing this. Nothing worries me at a glance at whether this is Gaussian because I see a lot of them really close to the line and I see just a few further out. Nothing bothers me about that. The thing that does irritate me is that there's a gap here in the, the width in centimeters 
for the height data. So I don't, I don't like that. That means that we're missing some data for a class of individuals here. But I wouldn't have guessed that we have almost everybody up here and we're, we seem to be missing some shoulders for the histogram. Is this enough to make me worried? Not yet, not yet. <clears throat> A second diagnostic plot, if any of you have done any regression analysis with me, you would all have seen me done do this plot. So um, as you know, we've mentioned it before, but it's a little bit beyond the, um, the boot camp. Uh, although we will do it in the EDA module a bit, is that um, for particular objects, data sets or other kinds of objects like a linear model object in R, certain functions will identify, like the plot function, will identify what type of object you're passing to it, and the behavior of that function will change depending on what kind of object you pass to it. The plot function is one of those, and if you pass it a linear model object, by the argument X, um, instead of, of merely making a scatter plot, because you know it's the it's a linear model object, it's not a data object. Instead, it it um, has four diagnostic plots built in, and you can control which one of them you display with the which argument. And here I've just displayed the first one. And what this is on the Y axis is the uh, it is the value of the residuals so it's centered at zero and there's a little very light gray line you might not be able to see it um, through the camera that goes right at the at the zero line and um, the dots are the residuals and uh, the um, x-axis for the first plot is the value of the x variable upon which each, um, each y value is predicted to produce that residual. And what we're kind of looking for here, this is to look at the assumption of heteroscedasticity. Okay, heteroscedasticity. What that means, as you may recall, is it's, um, it's differences in variance across, uh, across the, uh, the distribution of the residuals across these fitted values. So uh, heteroscedasticity is bad. We, we want homoscedasticity. We want a constant variance. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the spread of these dots to be even and not to systematically change, like to start near the line of zero at one end and get much bigger systematically at the other end. When we see that, it, it looks like a, a cone, and I call up that pattern the horn of terror because it, it doesn't work for regression. It's a flagrant violation of the assumption. This one does not look great, I have to tell you. Um, here are the things I observe. We don't have a huge amount of data. That's the first thing. The second thing I observe is we also do not have the same amount, the same density of observations for every value of the X variable. So we only have a couple of observations down at this end below four. And we only have um, a couple of observations in here between eight and 10. So that's not great. And also I see a lumpy pattern in here, but because we have a weird sample, I'm, I'm not really worried about that. And I see the, the range if I'm looking here at the one and the minus one <clears throat> on, on this, I'm kind of looking and I see that um, almost all the residuals with a few rare exceptions fall between one and minus one. And I note that that's, that's an even distribution on both sides of the graph. So the fact that there are gaps is, is not ideal, it's, it's bad. And the fact that uh, it's evenly distributed, that's good. So there's a bit of good and bad here. <clears throat> Another feature I'll point out on this diagnostic graph is um, I'll point out that uh, there are a couple of these dots that are numbered up here. And uh, these, are, these are data points that have what we call a high leverage. 
that means because they're relatively um, far away from some of the other values, their extreme values, they might have a relatively large effect. So these two dots up here are relatively large um, in terms of their uh, width relative to their height. And this one down here is, is relatively low in width compared to its height. <clears throat> so in certain cases, if we have a good reason to, we may choose to uh, say, oh, those are outliers and they're not real or they're mistakes. Um, if they're real, uh, we would have to, they may mean something and we can't just out of hand, it's, it's bogus to just throw them away because they're annoying if they're real. <laughs> But it, this is a diagnostic tool to see the shape of the data. I also give some somewhat fancier. I, I, I would almost never go to the trouble of graphing something like this for looking at my own data set. Um, <clears throat> and yet, you know, it, it is a powerful way to look at it. And so I, I produce some code that allows us to compare the density of our observed residuals compared to, and that's the green line, and it's superimposed over the actual histogram. So you can see how the green line tracks the histogram. And then on top of that, I have, um, I've drawn a theoretical perfect Gaussian distribution based on a population that has exactly the same mean as our sample and exactly the same standard deviation as our sample. So if our sample was perfectly Gaussian, remember we don't expect it to be perfectly Gaussian because it's a sample. So we expect a little bit of error, but if it were perfect, we would expect that those gray bars, the tops would um, line up perfectly with that blue dotted line, a dashed line. Um, and I've also put the, uh, the mean value of the residuals in, um, that we calculated from our sample, and that should be very close to zero, and it is here. And actually, the green line isn't a million miles away either. So this is just another way to think about the assumptions. So those are all ways that I might use, that you might use, to evaluate the assumption of um, the distribution of your residuals. <clears throat> Sometimes we may want a statistical test, and there are a lot of different ones for um, testing whether something adheres to a Gaussian distribution. And uh, the one that um, I'm showing here is called the Shapiro test. It's the Shapiro-Wilk uh, so-called normality test. <clears throat> the way we execute that is we would um, perform a regression, use the residuals um, function. And you know, in the code, if you go through this, if you run just this part, what you'll see is um, a lot of small values close to zero, some positive, some negative. It literally pulls out the exact calculated value for every residual. And then we just uh, perform a, a test against a theoretical expectation of Gaussian. So th this test is sort of the um, a way to formally and objectively test the difference between the green line and the blue line here. And it's being one of the assumptions of linear regression. Now, we uh, this is the full output of the test. We get a test statistic, the W. It's a quantification of the bigness of difference. And the hypothesis we're testing is that, uh, that uh, our observed distribution is different to Gaussian. And uh, if it is different, we expect the p-value to be, you know, close to the universal alpha of 0 0.05. Here it's bigger, so there's no evidence of a difference. Now the way we report this stuff, now that we're into some statistical tests, just like last week, we want to practice how scientists report this kind of thing in um, the technical literature. And uh, this would be a typical way for the Shapiro-Wilk we found no evidence the residuals deviated from the Gaussian expectation. We indicate the test that we used. We report three values, always three values for every specific statistical hypothesis. They are the test statistic, 
the degrees of freedom or the sample size and the p-value. That's the minimum that we report. So here we have the test statistic. It was 0 0.97. The sample size, the number of um, rows in our perch subset is 56. And the p-value is 0 0.14. Now, there's this thing that I, I see. It, it It's a bit of a pet peeve, but it's like, it's one of many pet peeves that statisticians have uh, for the imprecise use of language for reporting evidence. And uh, one of them is that if you do a statistical test and um, you find no difference, that you claim there is, there is no difference. So it, here you might claim if you did this that um, because you found no difference, you, you might claim that therefore my residuals are Gaussian. But actually, it's a subtle point, but uh, to be perfectly accurate, we don't have any evidence that our, um, that our um, residuals are Gaussian, but we, we lack evidence that they are different to Gaussian, okay? subtly different. <clears throat> And then finally, uh, I didn't have quite enough room to uh, put the um, code on here. It's just using the summary function. We'll use it if you go through the script. We're going to run out of time to do very much of it together tonight. But um, this is the results of printing the summary function, passing the uh, linear model object to it. And we get, get actually quite a lot of stuff out of it with R. So this is a typical one. And for simple linear regression, um, this is quite a lot. I'll just go through these line by line because we get the same kind of output. Sometimes it's a lot longer for particular models or particular data sets, but we basically get the same kind of information no matter what kind of linear model we use. So it's worth really unpacking this. And we'll come back to it when we do the ANOVA one. So the first one up here is just a formal statement of what is what is or might be called your call. So it's it's literally the way that you have specified your statistical model in code to R. Could be useful just to remind you what it is, especially, I mean, with one, this is so simple and we've only done the one model, but remember, we often might be doing several models and comparing them and we, we have a lot more variables in there, so we may well do more of them. So this is just a little friendly reminder about which model we're looking at. <clears throat> Second, we have some descriptive statistics that uh, outline the um, some summary values for our residuals. We have the median, we have the minimum, the max, and we have the what is called the um, interquartile range, the first quarter. And so 25% um, of the data are this value or lower. 75% of the data are that value lower, the first and third quartiles. What we're looking for here, if you do look at this, this is a proxy for looking graphically at the, the distribution, the Gaussian distribution of your residuals. The, uh, if, if <clears throat> this adheres perfectly to Gaussian, the median should be very close to zero, and it is here. And the min and the max, and the first and third quartiles, they ought to be similar to each other, but a different sign. Um, and so the min and the max are, they are similar, and they're obviously a different sign, and the quartiles are also very similar. So based on these, you know, yet another way of testing, a, a, this is the fourth way, of looking at the residual distribution. Nothing, nothing bad to tell us this deviates from Gaussian jumps out at me. What we're really interested in here, though, is this coefficients block. This is what we've come for. Um, and this, this block, the way the, the, this is organized, is called an ANOVA table. It's a little confusing, but that's just the way it is. The way an ANOVA table is arranged is that you have the alpha and the beta as row titles and 
and traditionally on a traditional ANOVA table for simple linear regression, the uh, alpha is the intercept, <clears throat> has its own row, and the predictor variable, um, which we multiply by the slope, has its own row. And again, it's just an idiosyncrasy of all of statistics that the alpha is it's called the intercept, whereas we we say the slope, we usually refer to um, a, a particular variable that's associated with that slope uh, to, to name that estimate. Now, now, both the slope and the um, intercept are estimates. They're estimates of those values, alpha and beta. We call them estimates. Because remember, the alpha and the beta are population parameters, the global population of all perch, though we can't measure them all. So our sample merely estimates those parameters. So that's, that's the etymology of the word estimate here. Now, uh, our estimate of the intercept <clears throat> is um, 0 0.30, if we round it up to two decimal places and 1.59 for the slope. And, uh, you know, remember this was in, um, this was predicting the, the height as a function of width, right? And the slope, we interpret this literally as when, when, the, um, when the width increases by, um, go on, Matt. Yeah, it's a question really. I, I'm wondering if we've um, fallen prey to a, a, a misunderstanding with this data set because one doesn't really predict the other. They are just correlated, aren't they? They're both just measures of size. I mean, the underlying cause is probably something like age. Yeah, yeah, you you actually are are correct. You would want to think this through. That's good. That's good thinking. But remember, we're just going through an example here. So give me some slack. <laughs> Sure, sure. No, it's just the distinction between causation and correlation. Oh, no, you're, you're, you're all right. You are right. But, uh, but nevertheless, even, um, even um, I mean, you're thinking biologically, but, but statistically, if we use regression to make a prediction, we, we can assume, and if we do assume, it may not be a safe assumption, but if we do assume, and we certainly can assume in this case, that, um, that all of the other things like age, that that might be a direct causative influence on um, on height. Um, that if those correlations stay the same for different widths of fish, that that we can still use width to make a prediction indeed about height. And you're you're all, you said another thing too that um, we're only using this to summarize this our sample, and that that is true. But remember, we're only um, I haven't gotten to it in the output yet, but uh, we 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 are explaining a certain amount of variation, and there's some unexplained variation that will be explained probably by considering some of those other factors. And and if we were to take another perch of a of a uh, that wasn't part of our initial sample, we could multiply it by the slope and add the intercept and have an estimate of its height within that error. So we still can use this in exactly the way intended. <clears throat> um, but it is a good point. We want to keep the causation and correlation in mind. But, um, but yeah, this is just an example. Um, so we have a, because this is an estimate, this is our um, <clears throat> beta hat for this linear regression, we have a, a standard error around the estimate, and that standard error is very small. If if around two times the standard error overlaps zero, um, you know, it would mean that probably our estimate is, is we don't have evidence it's different to zero, but in this case, um, it's it's way different to zero. And, uh, and also our p-value here in scientific notation is very small indeed, so highly significant. And interestingly, the um, the intercept is not significantly different to zero. We usually could care less about the intercept. And here, what that means is that um, when when width is zero, the uh, the height is you know we have no evidence it's different to zero. Okay, that makes sense. We also get a bit of information down here. 
because we're running out of time. Um, <clears throat> we have a just a brief summary of some things, and the one that um, we, in the least common denominator, would look at for simple linear regression is just the multiple r squared. This is the plain old r squared, and there's a corrected version of the r squared for. Um, um, well, we may come around to that in a future session, but the, unless something weird is going on with simple linear regression, these should both be very similar, and we would typically report just the um, plain old R squared for, uh, for this. We do have degrees of freedom for the statistical test of the slope, and again, the p-values echoed down here. So if we were to report this, <clears throat> Sometimes it's um, I, in the lab. If you go through the code for the lab, you'll see that I write the regression line onto the um, onto the. Um, I may do it in the next slide too. We sometimes re write the regression equation on onto the graph that we make. So here it would be length is equal to our rounded intercept times our rounded slope times the width. That's our simple regression equation, and we might say we found a significant linear relationship for height predicting weight and perch. Notice here that I'm um, reporting the uh, R squared, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value, and uh, not the scientific notation, but I'm reporting it as less than one ten thousandth, which is the lowest typical one we would report. And also note that um, I'm not reporting the intercept um, statistical result. It it is not interesting in this case, and it mostly is not interesting in in most applications. That's it. We took so long. I took so long rambling through those slides. I think it was important to go through them. But uh, what I have is um, if we go back to the um, the page for the oops, not the boot camp. Back to the Herrig main page. <clears throat> you can uh, have a look at yourself. The uh, script, um, there's a script template and a fully laid out script if you want to run through that. Everything but the, um, but the exercises is, is all filled in and it's elaborated on a little bit from the actual boot camp page. All right, guys, I took so long and I have to bump over to the next section. Uh, I know somebody sent an email and said that they would like to come to that next session. So let me drop the link for the next session in here. Here we go. Copy link. So, of course, this is just uh, optional. Pleasure, Eugenia. There it is. I'm going to um, stop the recording. And uh, 